greatest drama, the memorable story of the great among us, written by you, the people. This chapter, The Mark of a Man, the story of Henry Ford. Seventh, 1947. Spring storms lashed the Midwest, turning the River Rouge into a flood that swept over the grounds of the Henry Ford estate. The old man, now 84, went out to inspect the damage. The effort was too much. He returned to the mansion, and a few hours later, it was like a mighty tree had fallen. His passing marked the end of an era. He was born into the horse and wagon age of the last century, but the slow motion of the times was not for him. He sped up the tempo, swiftly, into luxury autos. More than any other man, Henry Ford was responsible for the modern vehicles that have changed the face and habits of America. He gave Americans a credo of success, one that had served him well. In an early radio broadcast with Thomas Edison, he said, The young man makes up his mind to work. There's no limit to what he can do. But if he makes up his mind to go at it without the idea of work, uh, he hasn't much chance. He must study and work, and he must go back in any art as far as he can, just dig up the very beginning. And he must, the more he goes back, the further he will be able to see ahead. Yes, Henry, you preached and practiced the virtue of hard work, but ironically, your hatred of farm labor was the cause of your success. Born on a farm during the Civil War, you went to a country school, didn't get much of an education. You were 24 years old when you and your wife moved to Detroit. In 1893, the year your son Edsel was born, you experimented with a newfangled contraption, a horseless carriage. A queer looking thing, you gave it a queer name, the quadricycle. Folks laughed at the notion, but you carried on, encouraged by your wife. Late one night, you pushed it out of the shed. You chose the late hour because you didn't want the neighbors to laugh at you if it didn't work. But go it did. That moment was worth the years when you begged, borrowed, and went hungry to raise the money to build the quadricycle. It worked, and you were in business, the automobile business. To advertise your gasoline buggies, you designed and built a racing car, the famous 999. You hired a speed-crazy bicycle racer named Barney Oldfield to drive it. You took the monster to a nearby racetrack. Oldfield had never driven a car before. He hit 60 miles an hour. A week later, the Ford Motor Company was organized. The first cars were expensive for those days. Only the rich could afford them. Henry wanted to bring the price down. But how? The answer, by speeding up production. But again, how? Henry found a solution. The assembly line. The first assembly line was crude. Little by little, he improved it. 1903, $850. In 1914, $550. You saw them everywhere, the good old Model T, known affectionately as the Tin Lizzie. You cranked her up. Motorcycle car. Henry had come a long way since the days of the little shop behind the house. He now owned huge factories and foundries. He was rich beyond his wildest early dreams. Walking through a plant one day, he saw a worker glaring at him. The man hated him. But why? Was it because he had so much and the man so little? Henry resolved to change that. A few days later, he issued an announcement. It shook industry to its roots. Business leaders predicted that Henry would shortly go bankrupt, but he knew what he was doing. He had a new idea, a big idea. He figured that a well-paid worker would be happier and more productive. He reasoned that a man with money in his pocket would buy an automobile. It 
sounded like insane logic in 1914, but Henry was right. The with a crash. The business recession of 1921 hit Henry hard. He had always avoided dealing with Wall Street. Now Wall Street bankers offered him a badly needed loan if he would make one of their men treasurer of the motor company. Henry called a meeting of his executives. Should he accept a loan and turn control of the company over to the money men? It was the hardest decision of Henry's life. A crucial meeting to decide the future of the Ford Motor Company. Henry turned down the Wall Street loan. Instead, by economy measures, he reduced the price of his cars. Result, the assembly lines began to move again. By 1928, when the last Model T came off the line, Henry had built and sold 15 million of them. A year later, you were called to the White House. The stock market crash had turned the country into panic. Asked by President Hoover to help restore public confidence, you responded with a general wage increase at a time when wages were being slashed. You were 61 years old, one of the wealthiest men in the world but your most precious possessions were your grandchildren. Your tastes were simple. Tinkering with an old steam engine was fun. You loved to ice skate on a frozen pond and dance the well-remembered country dances of your youth. For relaxation from business, you went on camping trips with Tom Edison and John Burroughs. You were with President Hoover in Edison's laboratory on his 83rd birthday. Of that little invention, you multiplied the life in the world by a thousand fold. Another old friend was Orville Wright, inventor of the airplane. But your most constant companion was your son, Edsel. Together, you and Edsel campaigned with Alf Landon, the Republican presidential candidate, in 1936. You were proud of your cars. Together, you examined the new car models in 1939. Those cars were displayed at the World's Fair later that year. At the fair, you and Edsel entertained Al Smith and Fiorella LaGuardia. Those were the good days. Then came the Second World War, and you shifted to war production. Edsel drove the first scout car to come out of the plant. At Willow Run, near Detroit, you built a huge new plant for the production of bombers. You and Edsel checked the first planes to come off the new assembly lines. Edsel was your right hand. More and more, you depended on him. So when the blow fell in 1943, the effect on you was devastating. Eighty years old, you had outlived your son. You grieved with your grandson, Henry II, for his father. In all your eventful life, you had never suffered a blow half so severe. Grief-stricken, you and your wife brought Edsel to his last resting place. Edsel gone. It's hard to believe. Seems impossible. Why, you can recall his face as it was only yesterday. Edsel gone. Who will take his place? Not Henry II. Edsel's oldest son, he's in military service. Benson, also in military service. No one to take Edsel's place but yourself. Eighty years old now, Henry resumed the post of president of the company, the position Edsel had held for years. Back into harness in old age, Henry supervised production of bombers. When army officials came, the old man was there to show them around. It was a heavy load, and four score years had taken their toll of his strength. Henry was weary. On his 83rd birthday, a moment that gladdened the old man, a visit with children of the neighborhood. He had always loved children, but now they reminded him of the past. Later that day, a visit to the place where it all began. The quadricycle, an old friend, just about the only survivor of the old days. 
Sitting there in the machine, Henry's thoughts drifted back to that fateful year, 1893. Himself as a young man, the machine that was to revolutionize travel and make his fortune. Well, both ambitions had been achieved. Few men had lived a fuller life. A year after that visit with a quadricycle, Henry Ford was dead. Gone, but forever present in the cars he helped to create. His memorial, the concrete highway speeding the country on its way. He built scout cars and bombers to defend the United States. Without him, the face of the land would not be the same. Of Henry Ford, it may well be said, he left his mark on America. again next week at this time when the greatest drama, true film biographies of the great among us, again comes your way.